If you ask a bird lover why he or she loves birds, you're likely to get as wide a variety of an answer as there are species of birds. Some might say it's the magic of flight, or the freedom of the sky, or the miracle of nature. And some might say there's something mythical about it. You know, you think about the, uh, the, the bird gods of Egypt. And others will talk about biodiversity. There's definitely something wonderful about walking through downtown San Francisco and seeing a bird and realizing we haven't completely just paved over nature. I know for me personally, my love of birds started early and was instilled in me by my dad. I, I'll never forget the first time I saw a great blue heron take flight, and it's still something that remains with me very, very strongly to this day. Most birders are interested in identifying a wide variety of birds, and to accomplish this, we are fortunate to have the expert guidance of artist, writer, and naturalist David Allen Sibley. His 2000, his 2000 Guide to Birds reshaped the world of birding and established him as one of the best and most knowledgeable illustrators of birds. The, bird is so ubiquitous, the book is so ubiquitous that birders have turned his last name into a noun. As in, what's that bird? I don't know, check your Sibley. He's here this evening to tell us about the long-awaited second edition, a complete revamp of the original. Please join me in welcoming to the JCCSF the one and only David Allen Sibley. Well, thank you. Wow. That's a lot of uh, bird watchers. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for supporting me, supporting my books, um, and uh, supporting your local organizations. It sounds like there was a good showing from all of the uh, partner organizations here tonight. That's great to hear. Um, but thank you for being here. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here in San Francisco also. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my, my background, my process, um, what goes into my books and um, the artwork, and then I'll be happy to take some of your questions. Um, but I will, um, well, for me, it started very young. My interest in birds, uh, I can't remember a time when I wasn't interested in birds. I, from uh, the time I was very young, um, I started keeping a life list when I was seven years old. I had already been interested in birds and drawing birds even before that. Um, so for me, bird watching and drawing are two parts of the same thing. They're, they go together. Um, and it's something I've done literally my whole life. Um, here's one of my... <laughs> One of my early bird drawings, um, this was uh, when I was about eight years old. Um, and I, I, like I said, I had been drawing birds already for several years at this time. Um, now, I should say my father's an ornithologist, so that probably had <laughs> something to do with my interest in birds, but also all of the opportunities and the uh, the support that I got for my interest in birds and drawing. So there were bird books in the house, and I enjoyed, as a little kid, pulling those books off the shelf and flipping through the pages, finding a picture that I liked, and um, copying it, first tracing when I was young, and then, and then copying. At this stage, I, I copied this picture of this peregrine falcon from a book that we had. Um, and about the same time, about eight years old, I started drawing birds from life. Um, and at that time, my father was actually director of Point Reyes Bird Observatory for a year and a half in 1969 to 70. So I, I spent my, my third grade year in the Bolinas School um, and learned bird banding at Point Reyes Bird Observatory when I was eight. Um, this is me at about 12 holding a sharp-tailed sparrow that we uh, banded in Connecticut. Um, where we moved after Bolinas. So at this age, I, I was still a serious birder, still doing lots of drawing, lots of bird banding. Um, and I think as a kid, the bird banding was a really important part of my 
um, my early interest in birds. Um, just the opportunity to hold a bird in your hands, to get that, the sense of touch involved and to feel it, to, to really see it up close, feel it, um, be able to study all the parts. And um, it helped with the drawing, but it was really just a kind of a magical experience. If any of you had the opportunity to do any bird banding or to hold a bird in your hand, um, one of the most uh, surprising things about it is how little a bird weighs. There's so much life and energy there, but they only, this sparrow probably only weighed 10 grams, um, less than half an ounce. Um, a bird like a kinglet or a Wilson's warbler only weighs five or six grams. You could put five of them, uh, put a stamp on five of them and send them anywhere in the country. <laughs> Um, and my interest in birds and drawing also involved, or it was, was supplemented by an interest in books from a very early age. I was fascinated by or, or drawn to the idea of putting all of this information together into a book. So I drew, it, it was scientific illustration. My drawings were all about um, conveying information. So I would learn things about birds as I watched them, and I would learn by drawing. Um, the drawings were also a way of recording, remembering, recording, and um, transmitting what I was learning. And I liked the idea of creating a book that would take all of that information that I was learning, um, both the, the words, the information, and the pictures, putting all that together. Um, I really enjoyed looking at bird books, reading them, and um, uh, thinking about making my own. So this is a, an early book project of mine, a limited edition of one, um, <laughs> but on a typewriter with glue and uh, black and white photographs and colored pencils, I was writing the Warblers of Connecticut. Um, so this, I was about uh, 13 years old. This is the first white-winged crossbill that I ever saw and this was in, in Connecticut. Um, and uh, so this, as a birder, you could see this bird, and you see the white in the wings, and you see the crossed bill. You know it's a white-winged crossed bill. You can check it off on your life list and move on. But for me, as a, my interest in, in drawing, um, uh, just doing this relatively simple sketch, there's, this is just an outline, really, a few other details, but mainly an outline, but there's a tremendous amount of information that goes into that outline. Um, so just the act of producing this simple drawing forces me to look at the bird in a very different way, to look at all kinds of details that I would um, otherwise not notice. So the shape of the head, the proportions of bill to head, how the bill and the head fit together, um, the size of the body, the length of the wings, the length of the tail, the length of the legs, the angle of the legs, all of those things and many more details are all things that you have to look at in order to do even this really simple drawing. Um, and that to me is the real value of sketching. I. Uh, sometimes talk about it as being like an interview with the bird. That I, the sketching is a, is a way, it sort of, it guides my study of the bird. It, it um, uh, I don't want to use the word it, that it forces me to do something, but it, it, it creates a, a, uh, um, a method, a, uh, a path for me to study the bird, where I, I look at different parts and in order to do, the, to do the drawing, I have to figure out how all of the different parts of the bird work together. Um, and that, to me, is the real value of sketching. Um, the finished product is rarely worth uh, showing to anyone or hanging on the wall. It's, um, but it's the, the value is in the process. I learn a little bit from each sketch that I do, and just putting the pencil lines on the paper is sort of a test of how much I actually know about the bird. Um, 
So the, the process guides my study of the bird, and it's also a, uh, um, uh, an opportunity to, to figure out or to show wit, what I know and what I don't know about a bird. So I never really feel like I've seen a bird until I've drawn it. Um, this is a picture of me sitting in the back of a friend's car in Maine, um, and uh, I'm sketching a northern hawk owl in this picture. So um, in a, I'm going to show you some other northern hawk owl sketches that I did through the years, and we'll get back to this one in a couple of minutes. So this is the first northern hawk owl I ever saw. It was in, within a couple of weeks of my first white-winged crossbill that I just showed you. So you can see the similarity in the style of sketching. So I'm about 13 years old, and um, this bird, we were on a family trip, um, took a detour to see it where it was spending the winter in upstate New York, and I did these sketches in the car as we were leaving. And one of the details that I wanted to capture in this sketch, one thing I had noticed during the few minutes that we watched the bird, was that on the lower sketch here, you can see that the, you can't see a hawk owl's feet branch that it's sitting on just disappears into the feathers of the belly. And the feet and the perch, the actual perch, are never visible. So that was one of the things that I noticed looking at that hawk owl and uh, wanted to record in this sketch. But this was not a long study. This was a few minutes and uh, sketching after the fact. Now this hawk owl is seven years later in Portland, Maine. And uh, this was the first, these are the first sketches that I did um, when I arrived and started watching that hawk owl. And sketching is all about simplifying, and it's a very um, tricky process. It, um, you're taking a, a living, breathing, three-dimensional, full-color bird and converting it into a few pencil lines on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. So you have to it involves a lot of trial and error, trying to find the right lines, the right curves, which, which markings, which of the dark and light patterns are really key to identifying, to capturing the essence of that bird. So here I'm just beginning to experiment with some of the lines and patterns. And a couple of hours later, after probably five other pages of sketches and a couple hours of watching the bird, um, I did this sketch, so I'm starting to get a better sense of the shape and um, uh, pattern of a hawk owl. Now I went back um, a few days later and spent another few hours with the same hawk owl, and doing this sketch, I spent about two hours on this one sheet of paper, um, just looking at every, trying to look at every detail of the bird, every aspect, and I, I so this would be sort of the the in-depth interview, the, the feature story of trying to see all of the aspects, every, sh every curve of the outline of the body, how all of the feather patterns and uh, feather arrangement fits into that. So there's a lot of erasing on this sketch, typically the way it would go. Well, typically my sketches, I might watch a bird for several minutes and then spend 30 seconds actually drawing. Um, and this just involved many cycles of that. So looking at the bird for a minute or two, sketching for 10 or 20 seconds, looking at the bird again for a minute or two. And often what I see in that minute or two of watching, I'm trying to memorize a few details that I can then transfer onto the paper. Um, but often when I look down at the paper at my partially finished sketch, and I'm ready to add those few details that I've memorized, I find that the, the work that I've done up to that point is not quite right, and I have to make some modifications before I can fit in the new details that I've memorized. So I erase some things and try, try a new uh, version of a little part of the bird, and by then I've forgotten the things that I just memorized, <laughs> and I have to look at the bird again, and and reconfirm all of that. So it's sort of a two steps forward, one step back process, lots of testing and experimenting and, and revising and erasing. Um, but eventually, after a couple of hours, I came up with this. And this, 
to me, this is a, um, it's a, there's a lot of detail. There's almost too much detail here. It's sort of a, to me, it's a, it's a stiff and overly, um, uh, overly detailed sketch. Um, but the, again, the value of it was in the process. Just the, the way that it, that it allowed me to look at every part of the bird and, and uh, experiment with different patterns and lines and figure out how to draw a hawk owl. Um, so after that, a couple of hours later, um, I was able to do a sketch like this, which I think is starting to capture the essence, the real spirit of a hawk owl in just a very few lines. It's sort of a caricature of a hawk owl, um, trying to be as realistic as possible, but still just um, uh, sort of a caricature drawing, just uh, with just a few lines and, and dark and light patterns, trying to uh, represent that bird. Um, so then, oh, and I should say this, this was 1981, and that was um, right after I had um, finished college. Well, I went to college for almost a year, and then <laughs> left to go bird watching full time. So I finished college, and at this point, I had just left, um, and, I, and I was starting my, my years of full-time birding and sketching um, basically every day for about um, 10 or 12 years. I was uh, just birding and sketching. Um, so this is seven years later. This is the hawk owl that I was drawing sitting in the back of my friend's car in Maine in that photograph a few minutes ago. And this was, again, now hawk owls make fantastic subjects for drawing because they sit still and they sit in the open <laughs> sometimes for hours. So you can really set up a telescope and start drawing and work on your paper for five minutes and look back in the telescope and the bird is still there. Um, so they make great subjects for drawing, but this is, um, I had spent a couple of days um, many hours, again, watching this bird doing a series of sketches. This is one of the last sketches that I did, and I really put a lot of time into this one. Um, and it's seven more years of almost full-time drawing and sketching. So I've learned a lot about birds and drawing, and all of that went into this sketch. But this sketch is actually very unusual for me for a field sketch. I don't do f these sort of finished pencil drawings in the field. Um, and it's a combination of the, the bird being very cooperative and having spent a lot of time with it and uh, really getting to know it. Um, but here's a, a more typical page of my field sketches. These are Leech's storm petrels. So this would be a, a typical page of my field sketchbook. Um, and Again, this was probably half an hour of watching, watching these leeches, storm petrels in flight, and I'm trying to capture the, the wing shape, the posture, just the flow of their movements in flight, trying to capture that in a few drawings. So I'm experimenting with all kinds of wing shapes, and you can see on the middle left, the whole left side there, those three images on the left side, the, the middle one is just scribbled out. I started it, and it wasn't working, and I scribbled it out. The one above that, I, was, I started with one wing shape. I had drawn one outline for the wing and then moved the whole wing forward. Um, that's the kind of adjustments and corrections and, and uh, experimentation that you would see in my, my typical field sketches. Um, but again, this is probably a half hour of watching and maybe only two or three minutes of actually um, putting pencil on paper. Uh, and this is a more recent typical field sketch. These are hooded warblers that I saw in Texas a couple of years ago. And here I'm, I'm just, I'm, I've watched the birds along the path. They're, they're hopping around, very active, moving and feeding. And I'm trying to capture some of the postures and, and shapes. Um, and this, and people often ask me how 
how can you draw a bird when they're constantly moving and you only get glimpses of them? It's hard enough to see a warbler, let alone draw it. Um, and uh, the answer to that is that what I'm drawing in a sketch like this is only a few little details that I've observed in this moment. Uh, most of what goes into this drawing is things that I already know about warblers, about the way birds' wings work, about the angles that the legs move. <clears throat> so I notice a few details while I'm watching the hooded warblers, and then I can look down at the paper and do a quick, a quick sort of warbler template and modify it slightly in the ways to capture what I've just observed. So I learn a little bit from each sketch that I do, and, and thousands and thousands of sketches um, gradually builds up the, uh, the knowledge to be able to see a bird fairly briefly and, um, and still notice a few details that I can put into a, a sketch. Um, so I can, well, it's still very important to uh, have a, a good look at a bird. I can't sketch a bird that's very far away. I have to see it up close and in, in quite a bit of detail. And the longer that you see it, the better. <laughs> but I can do a sketch that uh, is based on just a fairly quick view of a bird. Now, so I spent about 12 years traveling, um, birding, and sketching in the field. And what I do in the field is all pencil sketches, just stacks of pages like what I've just shown. Um, then I get back in the studio, and when I'm doing paintings for the field guide, um, I have all of my field sketches. I pull out as many photographs as I can find of the species that I'm going to work on and uh, try to come up with the quintessential outline of the species. So I try to pick a pose and a shape and get the right proportions that will represent that species in that uh, to be a sort of average, normal looking, um, stereotypical example of that bird. Um, and when I start the painting, well, it's kind of, well, you can see the pencil outlines above these painted birds just a little bit on the screen there. So the, the pencil outline that I start with for the painting is just a very simple outline um, and fairly rough. And I add all of the details in the painting process. Um, so I refine the shape as I'm painting and um, add all of the plumage details. Most of the plumage details are added while I paint. So this, this is Baikal teal on the left and falcated duck on the right. It's two species that I added to the revised edition of the field guide. And those sketches above were meant to be the females, but I realized that um, there wasn't going to be room to add the females of those species in the revised edition of the field guide. So I never finished painting those two. Um, but it's a good opportunity to see the, the pencil outline that I would begin with. Um, and better than the, I did, actually did several hundred other paintings that I painted and then found that there wasn't room for them in the field guide. So, <laughs> um, so here's a northern sawwood owl. This is the Queen Charlotte Island subspecies of northern sawwood owl, which does this is another one that's added to the second edition of the field guide. So this, it would have started with a simple pencil outline like the ducks. And at this stage, I've added probably five or more very light layers of brown and gray paint to begin the painting process. So I'm starting to build up some of the colors and patterns slowly through layers of paint. And I just keep adding adding a few details lightly, adding other layers of paint, and then adding a few more, starting to add some of the streaks on the underparts, building up the layers of paint slowly so that I can see how the colors and patterns and shapes are developing and make adjustments as I go. And I work on the whole bird all at once, so I'm painting, um, uh, painting it uh, all over from head to tail. Um, I don't paint the head and then work on the body or vice versa. And gradually adding more, adding more layers, adding more detail, just building it all up. And it really comes to life as soon as I 
paint some definition around the eyes. Um, and the final stage is just adding some more white, refining some of the edges, adding a little bit of light color on the shoulders and the back and the head um, to give it a little more three-dimensional look. But this is the actual um, finished painting that appears in the field guide. Um, and at this size, it looks uh, sort of, it probably looks fairly rough and sort of impressionistic. You see all the brush strokes and, um, but this is the, uh, I paint, I do the paintings at a fairly large size, not quite this big, but <laughs> about seven inches long for this one. So almost life size for a sawwood owl. And then it's reduced to about a third of that size in the field guide. Um, and that allows me to work with a fairly big brush. I work quickly and loosely and um, uh, putting the paint on. And I leave it at this stage um, knowing that it will look more detailed when it's reduced, but also I like, um, I like to leave it impressionistic and leave, the, leave out as many details as I can. So there's a sort of, there's a level of precision that's involved, but not a lot of detail. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in, well, right now. Um, <laughs> I think that um, it's really important to simplify the illustrations in the field guide as much as possible. And this sketch is an example of that. Um, so this is female costas and black-chinned hummingbirds. And if I were going to illustrate a field guide to the identification of female costas and black-chinned hummingbirds, which would be a very thin book. Um, but this is the only illustration that would be needed. Um, this sketch, just the outlines of the birds, provides all of the details that you need to distinguish them. All of the most useful things to distinguish these two species are shown in this sketch. The, the shape of the bill, the shape of the head, the proportions of head to body, the lengths of tail and wings, and other things, all that, those are the important details. And I think if I had added color to this, put in shading and green and buff and gray and, and added background or um, added uh, other, other elements to the painting, that would just distract you from the details that you'd need to see to identify the birds. And that's my my reasoning behind trying to simplify the illustrations in the field guide, to just show the general colors and patterns that you're likely to see at a distance and um, leave out all of the other details that you don't need to know about. Um, and that, uh, I think it helps also to allow you as the viewer to fill in some of those details, to use your own experience to add the to sort of build a scene around each illustration, to put your own experience into the book um, in a way that you, you can't really do with, uh, the other extreme is uh, photographs, which are a record of a moment in time. It's already a, a fully realized scene, one experience that, that the photographer had when they took the picture. Um, so it's more difficult for you as, as a, another person, another viewer, to relate that photograph to what you've just seen in the field. And I think the, uh, the more simplified illustrations without any background, without any habitat, uh, with very neutral lighting, neutral poses, and simplified colors and patterns allows you to superimpose all of your own experiences, your own stories on top of those illustrations. That's my theory of field guide illustration. Um, so these are some of the actual original paintings from the, the field guide. Um, I would, on a big sheet of paper, about 14 by 22 inches or so, I would put all of the images that I thought would go on a page in the book. So one sheet of paper represents one page in the book. And I would sketch out all the pencil outlines and then start painting all of the birds. I'd mix some gray paint and paint the shadows on all 12 or 18 birds on that sheet all at once and then mix some brown and put that wherever it was needed and mix the next color and add that to all the images. 
I think that helps. It helps to keep the colors and the style consistent across the whole page, but it also saved a lot of time being uh, efficient. And um, believe it or not, I don't have a lot of patience for painting. Um, <laughs> so I like to get results quickly. And each of these, when I was really on a roll and things were moving ahead smoothly, um, I could paint a whole page like this in a day. Um, on average, each image in the book took about an hour to paint. Um, some species take longer, obviously. Uh, birds like sandpipers with really complex patterns and subtle gradations of colors, that takes longer to build all that up. Um, other species, like crows or blackbirds, are much easier, and they went very quickly. Um, so working on the second edition, I, I still had all of these original paintings, and I took each one individually and looked at all of the images. I did a lot of touching up of minor things, little, just sort of little artist tweaks, fixing shading or fixing the outline. On about 10% of the images, I made big corrections. I really changed the plumage or the shape or added details that, that I had left out or um, or learned since I painted the birds in the first edition. Um, one example of a, a real correction is that if you have the first edition, you can look at the, the flying male rose-throated Bacard. Um, it doesn't have a rose throat. <laughs> I forgot to paint the little dab of rose on the throat of the flying Bacard. So I added it now. It's in the second edition. Um, so after the when the first edition came out, I had, all of these things that I added in the second edition are ideas and information that I've been collecting for 15, well, 14 years since the first edition went to the printer. I immediately started keeping a notebook of um, all the things I wanted to change or add or, or uh, fix in the uh, next edition. And then I went on to do some other books about birds and um, about Ten years ago, decided that I wanted to uh, do another book project that wasn't related to birds, and um, I decided on trees. And that book came out about five years ago. But I, I decided on trees because, um, after searching around and testing out some different ideas, I found that there are actually some real similarities between tree watching and bird watching, um, and the. The biggest or most important similarity being that they're the only two um, kinds of nature study that we can do in the course of our daily routine. Um, I, can, I could study trees um, in my backyard, on the way to the post office. Um, if my kids were at soccer practice, I could walk around the soccer field and look at trees for an hour. And the, um, it's the same with birds. You can bird watch anywhere. You can bird watch from your office window. You know, in a in a boring meeting, you can look out the window <laughs> and watch birds or trees. You can identify trees or birds from a moving car uh, across a field in a city park. Um, there, and you really can't do that with any other kind of nature study. You can't. You don't see snakes on your way to the post office or or <laughs> butterflies, dragonflies, all these other things require a lot, of, um, a lot of effort to find the different species. Um, so trees were something that I could, I could get to know and study just during the course of my, my daily uh, activities. And uh, I took them on as a, a project to do another book. Um, and I enjoyed the whole, the whole process, again, of putting together a book, of learning all of the details and the minutia of trees and tree identification. And, and then I, I love the feeling when those, all those details sort of fit together into a bigger pattern. Um, so learning things, for example, like um, box elder is really just a maple. It's in the maple genus. Everything about it is a maple, except that it has compound leaves. Um, and here's 
another tree example. This is um, gray birch on the left and quaking aspen on the right. There are two species um, common in the northeastern U.S. They both grow along roadsides and field edges, and they have whitish bark. They're superficially similar and, and sometimes confusing, but the twigs are very different. The structure of the twigs, um, the thickness, the direction that they point. And once you learn to distinguish these two species by their twigs, that same distinction works for all of the birches and all of the aspens and cottonwoods. So you learn these little details by studying one uh, challenging pair of species and then realize that you've learned something that applies to dozens of species. Um, in the same way, working on the, the first edition of the bird guide, doing all the paintings of the small songbirds, one of my great eureka moments was working on those paintings and looking at all the wide variety of patterns and colors on these birds, and then realizing that they all have the same, they're very different colors and patterns, but the same arrangement of feathers, exactly the same number and, and uh, arrangement of feathers on all these small songbirds, so that a streaked pattern is created by a dark line along the shaft of each feather, and the streaks can be broad or narrow or blurry or distinct or all different colors, but they always follow the same lines along the body of the bird, so that all these species, um, a female red-winged blackbird, um, any species with streaks has the same number of lines of streaks across the breast and the same number of lines of streaks across the back. And that was such a revelation to me that <laughs> all of this huge variety of colors and patterns followed some very simple rules. So there are uh, some very simple and, and predictable ways that the patterns can vary, um, some, some strict limits on how the patterns can go. Uh, so whether it's a fox sparrow or a yellow warbler or even a flicker or a Swainson's thrush, birds that have spots on their breast instead of streaks, they still follow the same arrangement of feathers. So the spots are lined up in the same way as the streaks, the same number of lines of spots across the breast of a Swainson's thrush. Um, and it just, uh, it all became clear. Um, and this, like the uh, birch versus aspen example, we get to know birds and uh, beginning birders or non-birders would call all of these birds cranes. They're all gray with long legs and long necks. But um, then once you start birding and learning the real names, you learn that the one on the right is a great blue heron. And as you get to know them a little better, get to know real cranes and get to know the great blue heron, realize that they're not related. They're in different families. They're different nesting behavior different migratory behavior, different vocalizations, different flocking behavior, feeding behavior, bill structure, feather structure, all these differences and more. Um, and you realize how fundamentally different they are. And that's, uh, to me, that's another part of the great uh, appeal of birding, is getting to know the birds as the species, as unique, uh, unique individuals and um, understanding all of their differences. Um, and there's a great difference in the demeanor also of these two species. And I'm sure the great blue heron would have no trouble taking on the five sandhill cranes. <laughs> um, and bird watching, it, it connects us to the natural world in really surprising ways. And I think one of the, the things that has kept birding exciting for me over the years is how changeable the birds are. That you never know what you're going to see every minute, every hour. They change by the week, by the month, and uh, also by the year. In my lifetime, my 40 plus years of birding, there have been tremendous changes in bird distribution 
birds that nobody would have considered seeing 40 years ago, um, like say wild turkey in the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area, are now common. Pileated woodpecker is an example in the Northeast that um, when I was a kid, it was a very rare bird. We had to work really hard to find one in the, the biggest patches of forest. And now in the Northeast, um, the, there's a lot more forest. The forests have matured. Pileated woodpeckers have spread throughout the suburbs. It's now essentially a backyard bird. Um, scarce, but it's not unusual to see one in your backyard. And that was, would have been just unheard of 40 years ago. Um, and the, so it's this, this surprising, constantly surprising, constantly changing aspect of birds that um, I think is a big part of their appeal. Um, and of course, that's very different from trees. <laughs> um, no, I'm sure nobody has woken up and wondered what trees they might see when they look out their window. Um, but you do, you wake up in the morning and wonder what birds are going to be at the bird feeder or what you might see as you walk through the park. Um, and you could walk through the same park, the same path, every day for 10 years and not see the same set of birds twice. Uh, it's just constantly surprising. And right now we're in the midst of one of the great global spectacles, the spring migration of birds, this annual shift of, incredible shift of biomass from one hemisphere to another. Um, species like yellow warbler um, migrating north out of the tropics and into, uh, into the, uh, all of North America from, from Mexico to tree line. Um, and it's, um, I think it's, well, it's tremendously reassuring and, and hopeful. There's an expression at Cape May, New Jersey, where I have done a lot of birding, um, that the, the birders say, you should have been here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a common theme among birders, that there's always something to look forward to. Something, something great is going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month. Um, there's always something new happening. Um, and that, uh, I think, in a way that the, the real fundamental appeal of birdwatching is really just um, seeking a connection to nature. And birds provide a convenient and exciting, a sort of a more and more socially acceptable excuse to set your alarm for 4.30 in the morning <laughs> and go outdoors even if it's raining. But that's what we really enjoy, is just the experience of being out there, seeing the sunrise, seeing the seasons change, walking through the park every week and seeing how the trees change through the seasons, um, seeing a migration of dragonflies or seeing a fox. All these other things that happen when we're outdoors are the sort of the byproduct of birding. But really, I think that altogether, that's the, the goal of of bird watching, and birds are just the convenient excuse to get us out there, to get us out of bed and outdoors to experience all the rest of it. Um, so I think that the, I think of the field guide as really just a, a directory, a kind of a contact list of birds that you might meet. And it tells you their names, it shows you a few pictures so you can recognize them. Um, but there's so much more to learn that you, when you find them um, and learn their names, then you can find out who they're related to, um, what they like to eat, where they spent the winter, where they're going to, whether things are going well for them or badly. All these things, like learning about the, the difference between herons and cranes, you learn so much more about them. And um, that's where the, the real, uh, pleasure and satisfaction of birding comes from getting to know all these birds. Um, so I hope that the field guide will uh, serve that function for you and be your, your introduction to uh, the world of birds and these 900 plus species that are out there to meet. So thank you.
we have some time for some questions. Anyone have some questions? If you're sitting in the middle of a row, um, please come out to the aisle. I've got the first question. Yeah. Right down here. How does he get the bird to come to your hand? Sorry? How do you get the bird to come to your hand? To sit on your hand. Oh, the picture of um, the sparrow. Um, we had trapped it in a, in a net. I was actually holding its legs so it couldn't get away. <laughs> and I let it go a minute later. Um, but you can, it is possible to, to train birds to come to your hand for food. Um, I think scrub jays will do that. Chickadees will do that. Um, it takes a lot of time and patience, but um, uh, it can be done. Next question on this side. Oh. Um, thank you for your talk. I happen yes. to have a family, a Mr. and Mrs. Redheaded. Um, oh, a finch, thank you. Okay. Redheaded <laughs> finch. And the male comes and taps. He, he, the question is, can birds see their reflection? Oh, yeah. And comes and taps on the bathroom window and just has a wonderful time with himself. <laughs> um, yes, that's a very common um, thing, especially this time of year when the males are, are territorial. They see their reflection in the glass and they think it's a rival male trying to uh, um, come into their territory. And so they're, they're trying to uh, uh, chase it away or, or uh, drive it off, and they can never quite reach it. It must be really frustrating. <laughs> but it happens, there's a few species, well, it, it happens to be the, the species that especially live right around houses. So it's American robins, um, house finches, um, Cardinals in the East do that a lot. It's the species that are living right up around houses. And uh, they, the, the way to solve that problem is to um, cover up the reflection. Um, you can try putting um, like a soap film on the window to dull the reflection so they don't see themselves or just tape a sheet of newspaper over the window so they can't see it at all and hope that then that they don't just move to the next window and start tapping on that one. That, that can happen. You don't mind, okay. It'll, it'll end in a few weeks once the hormones uh, taper off, so. <laughs> next question is over here to your right. Hi, David, thanks so much. It was really nice to hear what you had thanks. to say tonight. I also appreciated our walk yesterday. Um, I, you obviously have a passion for learning and sharing what you're learning with the world, and now that you've published this most recent um, bird guide and just earlier your tree guide, I'm wondering what what your next project is, what your next you know your next leap, or what what you're diving into these days or coming up. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the f the first thing on the schedule is revising the eastern and western field guides, the small books. And those, we're starting to work on those, and they're scheduled for 2016. Um, I'm also working on revising the app of the field guide with all the new material, and that, well, that will actually be out first. That should be out later this year, um, a, uh, a new version of the app. Um, and I have a couple of other book projects in the works, um, but they will wait until after these I'm in the, in the revision cycle right now, so finishing, taking all this new material and using it to revise the other books that are out. And that'll be over the next couple of years. And then after that, I, I do have some ideas for other, other book projects. Um, it'll be more about birds. I don't have any plans to go into um, any, other, uh, any other group like butterflies or or anything like that, or, or to another continent. I'm gonna stick with North America and birds for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so maybe in 10 years I'll have the energy or the time to think about something else, but for the next uh, 10 years or so, I think it'll be more, uh, more birds. Next question, back here, back in the house. Yep. Hi, 
Um, I just forgot my question. <laughs> have, any of, have any of the birds from the first edition gone extinct and are not in the second edition? I'm sorry? Have any of the birds that were in the first edition gone oh. extinct and are not in the second edition? Um, no. Uh, no, and I think in general the, the rarest species in the first edition have increased. Um, birds like California condor, um, whooping crane, they're doing fairly well. They're, well, I, I should say, if there are only a few hundred of them in the world, it's hard to say they're doing fairly well, but they're at least stable or increasing. Um, uh, there, um, there was one species, I, my book doesn't cover Hawaii, there was one species in Hawaii that did go extinct in the last 15 years, the, the Po'o'uli. Um, it was down to just three individuals about 10 years ago and they, they disappeared. So that's uh, sadly a U.S. bird that did go extinct in the last 15 years, but um, not one that's in my book. Next question is over here to your right. So I actually have two questions. Uh, one is you said that you had all the original paintings from the first edition and then you took some of them and, and redid them. Does that mean the, so the originals of those paintings don't exist anymore? <laughs> or yes. they're changed? Yes, they have forever changed, <laughs> yeah. Just curious. And then um, my second question is uh, when you were done with college, and you started doing birding and sketching full time. How did you manage to support yourself <laughs> during that initial period? Yeah. <laughs> um, mostly, well, largely by uh, controlling costs. Um, <laughs> I lived very cheaply. Um, I lived in a camper van and found free places to camp. The coast of California was a fantastic place. I camped at Pigeon Point and the Carmel River mouth and um, in the national forests um, wherever I could. Southeast Arizona was another great place to find free camping. So my only expenses were um, food and keeping the van going. And um, so I was able, I, uh, I had, I sold a little bit of artwork. I worked on a few small book projects. Um, I, um, towards the later 1980s, I had some other, um, uh, other things going on. Um, I worked for a tour company called Wings, leading serious bird watching tours. So I would go out on five or six tours a year. So maybe 60 days I spent um, leading tours, and I earned enough money from that to support myself for pretty much the rest of the year. Um, it just didn't take very much money to, uh, to do what I was doing. Um, and then as time went on through the, by the late 80s and early 90s, I had um, worked on books like Hawks in Flight and um, was starting to sell more artwork and, and, uh, and gradually got more and more settled as also as time went on, but, um, but that was, was basically by living very cheaply and finding whatever jobs I could that would pay a little bit of money and allow me to watch birds at the same time. <laughs> Next question back here. Do you have a favorite bird, and if so, could you describe your emotional reaction to it? <laughs> um, I... I, well, I generally say that I, I don't have a favorite bird, and then I generally go on to name one, but... Um, uh, so I don't have a favorite bird, but my favorite bird <laughs> is the um, long-eared owl is, is right at the top of the list. And the reason is when I... The first fall that I... What would have been my sophomore year in college, I, um, I got a job at Cape May, New Jersey, Cape May Bird Observatory, and um, they had an owl banding project, and it, that wasn't part of my job, but I volunteered to go out at two or three in the morning and help with the owl banding, and um, we trapped a few long-eared owls that fall. It's a pretty rare migrant there. Um, but I had banded a lot of birds. I had held a lot of birds in my life up to that point, and long-eared owl is by far 
the most feisty, the least submissive, <laughs> and the most dangerous bird that I've ever held. Um, they're so aggressive, so un, unsubmissive, and so flexible that you really can't hold them safely with one hand. They get you with either their bill or their feet, depending on which part of the body you're trying to hold. Um, and most, all the hawks, they don't try to use their bill for defense. You'd think that they would, but even a golden eagle, you can hold it by its feet, and you don't have to worry about the bill at all. But long-eared owls are very different. <laughs> so I appreciated that, that spirit, that, that uh, indomitable spirit that they had. Um, and also the fact that long-eared owl is maybe the, the only species or the, the most elusive species in North America. Um, that if you named any other North American breeding bird, even some very local ones, um, and said you wanted to see it tomorrow, well, it's a little late now, maybe the next day, <laughs> but you could get on a plane and go I could tell you where to go, get a plane ticket, you could go see it tomorrow. Um, but long-eared owl, even though it occurs from coast to coast, um, it's very sparsely distributed and very erratic. And the general reaction, if you ask someone in any state or county local bird club, where can I see a long-eared owl? The response will be something like, oh, gee, well, Two years ago, they nested in this canyon over here, but I haven't heard of any lately. Or they'll, it'll be, you know, usually in the winter, somebody finds one roosting somewhere, but not, not this winter. It's just, a, they're unpredictable, scarce, uh, erratic, and that makes every time you see one that much more of a, uh, a treat that you never know when the next one is going to be. So when you do run across one or have an opportunity to see one, um, it's a really special experience because you can't, it's a species that you can't just say, I'm gonna go see a long-eared owl. Um, so for those reasons, that's uh, <laughs> my favorite. Well, they're also really good looking and I enjoy owls in general. I have another question back here. Thank you. Thank you for this evening. It's just great. Thanks. I live in the city, and not every year, but certainly it's happening in the last three nights. I call them night birds. They're very loud. They're not especially melodious, but because it's dark, I can't see them. I don't know how to um, identify them. They're, I'm sure that they're migratory birds, but... <laughs> Uh, very, very loud at one o'clock in the morning. I open up all the windows and just lie there and just listen to this cacophony of chirping and bird sounds. Um, uh, do you have any ideas of? Hmm. <laughs> um, I, I don't. I. Uh, does it happen this around this time of year in the spring? Uh, it's happening now in the last two or three nights or early, early mornings. Is it repeated in the um, mm -hmm. So I think people are suggesting a mockingbird. Is that? Um, so there's a few, a few species of songbirds will sing at night. And mockingbird is one that's very, uh, it's well known for singing very loudly at night. Um, and They'll go on for a long time. Um, uh, I could play a recording of a mockingbird right now for you. <laughs> and we'll get this solved. Um, so there's, there just aren't a lot of birds that make noise at night. Um, Anything like that? <laughs> it it sounds. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, you can whistle quite well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
a, a lady over here suggested that it might be a tohi. Uh, I, they're, they don't sing at night as much, and they have a very short, one short simple song, and then a long pause, like 15 seconds, and then another song. Um, so it, I guess if, um, it depends on the, exactly the, the pattern of sound that you're hearing and, and what some more details of that. But if that recording sounded similar, then I would, I would bet it's a mockingbird. Uh. Next, next question up here. I'm so nervous and this is so exciting. Um, I have been birding for over 15 years and I've even banded, but I still struggle with the LBJs and especially the sparrows. And I was wondering if you had any tips as an expert uh, for how I can finally conquer my sparrow challenges. Uh, hmm. um, I think that um, the sparrows, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do have some tips. <laughs> um, they're, um, they're very distinctive in their own way, but um, I think you have to um, sort of get to know what the, what the key distinguishing features are and focus on those and, and not get... Um, calling them brown and streaked, they're all brown and streaked, so that's sort of irrelevant. You have to look at other things then. Um, size and shape is really useful. Um, habitat is incredibly useful for sparrows. Exactly where they are and what they're doing uh, will distinguish most species so that um, uh, you're only going to see savanna sparrows in certain places and song sparrows in certain places and golden crown sparrows in certain places and there's not a whole lot of overlap between them. Um, so I guess I would suggest um, taking, the, taking the field guide and, and going through with, um, just focus on the, the species that are really common here that you're likely to see and don't worry about oddballs like clay-colored sparrow. Just work on the, the ones that you're likely to see here. And it's going to be a pretty short list. And then there will be some that are, like golden crown sparrow is found in, in brushy areas and, and really never far from dense brush. Um, song sparrows are found in um, uh, low, dense brush, usually near water. Um, Savannah sparrows are found in open, drier open areas, grassland or um, in, the, in the brushy hedgerows at the edges of grassland, but they're in much drier and more open areas than song sparrows. Um, and you can start to work on some of those distinctions. Um, the more you can narrow down the list of, of candidates before you even look at the details of the bird, the easier it's going to be to... Uh, distinguish them. And, and then also um, pay attention to size and shape because there's a, obviously a huge difference between golden crown sparrow and chipping sparrow or golden crown sparrow and Lincoln sparrow. They're very different sizes but there are subtle differences in size and shape between all of them and that's a much more useful thing generally than the, um, the brown and streaked aspect. <laughs> the next question is over here. Thank you. Hi, David. Thank you for your incredible work. Thanks. How do you think your guide could be used to further conservation efforts? And what would you like to see individuals and organizations do to help protect habitat and, and species? Ooh, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I, um, uh, well, like I said, I, I hope that my, my guide just helps to introduce people to uh, the diversity of birds. And um, I think that's really the, the key to conservation is getting people outdoors to, to get to know the birds and appreciate them. And to that, and I think one of the most important things that anybody in this room could do is um, take some kids out birding 
or just take some kids outdoors. Um, get them outdoors and... <laughs> um, uh, look at bugs and plants and dead trees and stuff. I, um, when I think back on my, my earliest childhood experiences, my father is an ornithologist, so there was a bird focus. But when we went out on hikes on the weekend, it was him and some biologist friends. And the most memorable parts of those hikes for me were people who were you know, somebody was turning over rocks and finding mole crickets, and somebody else was picking berries off a bush and saying, here, try these. <laughs> and it was just a whole nature experience. Um, and the birds were part of it, but uh, I think that was, uh, that's really the key. And, and um, so uh, I think getting, getting kids involved in nature, getting kids outdoors is a really important thing to do. Next question on this side. Hi, um, I'm so nervous because I use the word Sibley that way that you talked about. <laughs> um, I've been birding for about 20 years. I started uh, for lots of different ways, but Ned Johnson at UC Berkeley and mm. um, all over the place, Rich Darkup and John Dunn, and I've been to the Arizona. I love it. I am obsessed with birds in the way that, you know, girls are obsessed with other things. But um, so this is such an honor. Thank you for coming. Mainly, thank you for bringing all thank these you. people together. I've never felt normal, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate it. <laughs> Um, and so I wanted to ask two part. One is, um, to me, you are so ultra famous and amazing. And to everyone in here, do you have some crazy experiences of, um, you know, you lead a normal life, but you also don't? And then the second part is, um, <laughs> do you ever come to schools? I teach at uh, Schools of the Sacred Heart, Stuart Hall for Boys, and you are invited right now, every day for the rest of the year, uh, okay. forever. <laughs> so let me know, Stools of the Sacred Heart. I'm Lauren Richardson. <laughs> Um, <laughs> all right, well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I, um, I, do, I do visit schools sometimes, and I will, I will definitely keep that invitation in mind. So, um, and, uh, um, I'm sorry, what was the, uh, I didn't quite catch the focus you, of your first question. Do you have any, um, when, when you're out in the world, you know, to us, you're so famous. If we saw, or said, someone said, Sibley's in the restaurant, we would all uh -huh. come over and, you know, be excited. <laughs> do you have some funny stories at all of being famous and, or being treated like a regular person? Oh, uh, well, um, okay, yeah, I was in um, New Hampshire a few years ago with my son and renting cross-country skis and filling out the form to rent the skis and the person taking the form looked at my name and said, oh, David Sibley, you know there's a guy who writes bird guides with that name. <laughs> Next question is over here. Um, the Allens and the Allens hummingbird and the uh, Rufus hummingbird, you say that they're virtually indistinguishable, but other books that I've looked at in comparison seem to have a different image and they really <laughs> distinguish between the two. So how do you compare what you're saying compared to other, or in contrast to other, other uh, authors or um, publishers? Yeah, um, well, <laughs> Allen's and Rufus hummingbirds are barely distinguishable. <laughs> um, they're distinguishable. Well, the adult males are distinguishable with about maybe 99% confidence. Um, uh, that they're um, the only difference that you can see really see in the field is that. The male Allens has a green back and the male Rufus has an orange back, usually. But some Rufus have green backs and some Allens have quite a bit of orange in their back. Um, and they do hybridize occasionally. Um, so in the hand, you can measure the width of the outer tail feathers. And then if you know whether it's an adult or immature male or female, you can look up the look up the range of measurements that are allowed for each one and see whether your measurements match. Um, and um, 
So that's how you can distinguish them in the hand, but in the field, it's um, other than adult males, it's in general under field conditions, it's just not possible. Um, with really good close-up photos of a bird in the field, that's sort of like having it in the hand, but even, even at that with the non-adult males, you, um, there's, uh, there's some, so much variation in the width of the tail feathers. Um, so anyway, it's, um, it is, it's, a, it's a problem that uh, comes up in the East when the, both of those species show up as vagrants in the East and um, everybody of course wants to know whether it's, most of them are rufous, but a few allens show up and whenever one shows up, everybody wants to know if it's rufous or allens and it's, uh, it's just incredibly difficult to figure out without um, trapping the bird and measuring the, those tail feathers. Um, we have so. another question right down here, down to your right. Okay. What's the rarest bird you have seen? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, the, I guess the, from a sort of global sense, I saw um, a couple of California condors back in 1985 when there were only five left in the wild. Um, so that was, the, that was just within a month after that, they had all been trapped and taken into captivity. And now, thankfully, there's, there are hundreds, a couple hundred in the wild and um, more. But um, from a birder's perspective, the rarest bird I've seen was a um, Buller's shearwater that is, now it's fairly regular off the coast of California here. They nest in New Zealand and they come to the North Pacific um, in their non-breeding season and quite a few show up along the coast here in the fall. Um, but uh, I was on a boat off the coast of New Jersey and a Buller's shearwater flew by, which was the first and still the only record for the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it was a life bird for me at the time. And ironically, I had just come from California <laughs> and hoped to see one here, but it was not a good year for them. So in like five boat trips in Monterey Bay, I did not see a Buller's shearwater drove back home, sadly, without Buller's Shearwater, and then a few weeks later off the coast of New Jersey, <laughs> there was a Buller's Shearwater. But that's one of the rarest birds I've, I've seen. Last two questions on this side. Hi, David, thanks again for yesterday at Bob Sutro Bath. So thanks. I've got a few very short questions. Do you want me to ask them rat-a-tat-tat or one by one? <laughs> or let you answer each one separately? Um, let's go one by one. Okay, so the first one is, how did you get your parents to uh, uh, save your early drawings? <laughs> um, there, there are only a few of them. Um, my mother saved a few, but most of them are gone. So that peregrine falcon is one of the very few that I have from that long ago. Okay, so the next question is, how did you develop your artistic skills? Were your parents artistic? Did you study it in school? What, what, uh, who are your teachers? Um, my parents are not artistic and I did not study art formally. I, I learned from other, um, I got a lot of encouragement and, and I learned from other artists along the way. I got tips. Um, I studied the work of other bird illustrators, but mostly, and I think the, the most important part of my training was just getting to know the birds because the the outlines that I draw, those simple pencil outlines that I use to start a painting are the most important part of the whole painting. Um, if any part of that outline is wrong, um, the painting won't come out right and there's no amount of painting technique or, or um, skill that can save a bird if the outline is wrong. So that, just getting to know the birds, the years of sketching and watching and, and practicing drawing those outlines, I think was the, the most important artistic training that I had. So with all the, the watching and sketching and observing, how do you prevent yourself from getting bored? I suppose the flip side of that is, how do you keep your interest? Because you're really doing a lot of the same, although there are a lot of details but I'm sure it could get a little monotonous at times. Um, I, 
I always felt like I was learning new things. Um, I felt like every sketch was helping me to get better at what I was doing. And I always found new questions to ask and new things to wonder about. And that still happens now. Essentially, every bird I look at, I think of things I don't know, things I wonder about, things I'd like to look at. If I see one golden crowned sparrow, I think, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to see a hundred lined up so I could check that or this on, on all of them and see how it varies. Or, or um, There's just an endless number of questions. And just like in any science, every, every question answered leads to 10 more questions that you can ask. So I think that's what really keeps me going, and it's still, it, it's just the same as it was 40 years ago. Last question. So drawings, like you have to bird by sight to draw, and I was wondering if, if you bird by sound and when you develop that, because I've been birding by sight for 11 years and the sound is still yeah. kind of hard. Sound is hard, yeah. Um, I, I do a tremendous amount of birding by sound, and I started, um, I mean, it was obvious to me at a, at a young age that it was a really important part of, of birding, so I set out to learn it. And I, I kept notes. I think that I mean, that's where my, my sketching sort of carried over into keeping notes on everything about birds, so I, I when I heard a bird sound, I, I tried to write down what it sounded like or do a little drawing of the pitch, how the pitch changed. Or, um, and I think that was really helpful to, to remember the sounds. But there's no substitute for just experience. And getting out there and actually, I think, um, finding a bird that's making a sound and watching it make the sound is a really good way to remember it. Um, Trying to imitate the sound or write down a description of it will also help to remember it. And, um, and also thinking about what the bird is doing or what, what information the bird is trying to convey with that sound. Because there are all, all different sounds that the birds make each mean different things. They're used in different situations. And that, if you're, you're trying to get a sense of sort of the bird language, so understanding um, what the sounds might mean, or even in the most general sense, what it means, um, I think would really helps to um, to remember the sounds and put them in context and and um, uh, develop a better uh, better sort of uh, um, repertoire or um, become fluent in <laughs> in bird. Uh. Well, a reminder, everybody, uh, that. David's going to be signing immediately after the program. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you, David Allen Sibley. Thank you.